All right, everyone. Last looks. Right on set. Roll sound. Sound speed. Roll camera. Camera speed. Scene one, take one. Mark it. And action. Hi, I'm Ed, the host of Savannah on Film, and we explore the economic and cultural impact and values of the film industry in Savannah through conversations with people who work in the industry and related fields. You can find us here on WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Sound, Community Radio, it's Global Soul. Hello, Savannah. Hello, the world. Welcome to another fascinating episode of Savannah on Film. And I've got uh, two greats here with me today. Um, and just uh, let me begin like we always do and let you know that uh, we're here to explore the economic and cultural impact of the film industry in Savannah through conversations with people who work in industry and related fields. We're here on Savannah's WRUU 107.5 FM LP savannah soundings community radio with global soul and uh a reminder that wruu is on twitter at wruu 1075 and today i have with me judith and alan moore and so i want to welcome welcome you guys to savannah on film it's it's been a long time judith judith and i have seen each other at many film mixers and it's an honor, a privilege to have you and you also, Alan, here today on Savannah on Film. It's going to be highly educational and a lot of fun um, for our audience here. And so I want to uh, thank everybody for tuning in. And just a brief uh, intro um, uh, of about, about Judith, a little bit about Judith and Alan. Uh, Judith is a founding member and secretary of SWIFT, which is also known as Savannah Women in Film and Television. Uh, she's worked on several productions in the costume and wardrobe departments. She's been a customer, a seamstress, a stitcher, everything else <laughs> uh, under that title. And Alan, um, He's no slacker either. <laughs> he is uh, on the advisory board of the Georgia Film Academy, um, a program I was privileged to go through and uh, learn some skills that have been very helpful um, in my career in the film industry. And uh, he is on the board of directors for GFA Georgia Film Academy uh, here at Savannah Tech in, in Savannah, Georgia. And uh, he often speaks with students and and shares his knowledge, but not not just being on the advisory board. He is also a retired producer, and he, uh, who had an office in Pinewood in England, and and uh, he did a lot of uh, racing films that he produced. So we're going to be talking about all of that. So very interesting. Um, and once again, welcome Judith and Alan Moore to Savannah on Film. Hi, Ed. Hi. Ed. Okay, um, let's see. Um, I'm just going to start with you, Judith. You started, you, you're working on um, Council of Dads, oh, your yeah. latest thing. And uh, the news broke not too long ago that Council of Dads is not getting picked up for a second season. And 
the Savannah film and TV industry is very devastated by that. Um, it's a shame. It was a good show. It was a lot of fun. Um, I got to be on there as a background actor one day. I'd never done that, but it was, it was a blast and, and I've enjoyed the show. Uh, what are your thoughts, Judith, on, on the demise of Council of Dads? I'm very sad. I love the show run runners, uh, Tony and Joan, and I thought it was well scripted, well acted. Um, we, we had our limitations, but I was very disappointed and surprised because I have to say that all along while we were making it, we really felt like NBC loved the show, but it's all a matter of numbers and we didn't hit that magic number that we were supposed to hit. Um, and so it's not coming back. I'm very, really very sad because it was our first chance in Savannah to do a long running TV show. Yeah, and, and to me, it seemed like for the storylines, they packed almost an entire series into yeah. one season. I mean, there's so many twists and turns in this show, and it, it tugs you by the heartstrings a lot, you know, and uh, that's a good thing. And uh, sad to see it go, um, but yeah, the, the, if the ratings aren't there, you know, I worried when it, it premiered behind this, this is us, it premiered, and then they gave it like a two-week hiatus. And and then I was wondering if they were losing confidence in it, but they didn't. And and then it seemed like they were they were very confident NBC about about the show. And then and then we just get the word out of nowhere that it's there's not going to be a season two. So it's it's very unfortunate. Um, something will come to take its place. Oh, definitely. And I'm and and it was that something else will come in. Definitely, definitely will. Um, I know as 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 I'm recording this, I know there's three films that are scouting locations in Savannah, even in, amid the pandemic. And we're going to talk a little bit later about restarting after the industry, which is, you know, obviously grind to a halt because of uh, COVID-19. And so um, there, there there will be other series. There will be other things. Um, who knows? There could be a second life. I know there's a campaign online. Oh, yeah. To... to um, I'm trying to think of the perfect hashtag, save our dads. I don't know if that would be a good one, but uh, yeah. save the council. I don't know. <laughs> it's all a matter of money. If it's, if it's cheap enough to make, then somebody will jump in and make it. And, and it can't be cheaper than any place else with the tax incentives that we have in the Savannah well, area. So, you know, yeah. and, and, it, and it was great because it's a council of dads is a show that savannah is very much a character in the show oh, so very you know and uh which scene were you in uh i got to be in episode five it was in the crab shack and oh, yeah. and it's one of those where you have to like you know uh blow up the picture of the tv <laughs> like super <laughs> magnify it and you'll see a little bit of the gray in my beard i was i was it was the scene where they were walking into the crab shack and uh, we were sitting there right as, right as they're coming up and about to seat them. And uh, I'm literally looking straight at the camera, I'm not looking at the camera, but you know, uh, my face is right there. But if you're familiar with the Crab Shack, they have the paper towel holder that was on top. So you see the paper towel holder and part of my beard. So it's like a half a second of fame. So <laughs> episode, episode five was always referred to as the train wreck. We did, we did Halloween, then we did Thanksgiving. Then we did Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, and Scott's birthday. Yeah, and in fact, when they were bringing the cake out there, I was on the other side, as, uh, me and um, three of my friends, we snuck back in <laughs> and actually got to sit down, but we weren't actually, that's not where the camera was. We were on the other side of the wall, and I guess that doesn't count, but... Um, it's, it's so great because so many people got employed by that show. Oh, um, yeah cast and crew and i mean every every everything I, I knew so many people so many people have been guests on this show and uh that i've I've worked with on films and and uh, i know we'll all work together again so um so you know r.i.p council of dads if it doesn't find a new home or a new way but um uh judith what got you started in 
costuming and wardrobe? Like, what was the spark? I started in in college at the University of South Carolina. I got wrote, I was studying philosophy, and a friend was in the theater department. And wrote me in to make the costumes because she knew I'd always made my own clothes. Mm -hmm. And after that, I moved to San Francisco, and I got my first professional job in the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco wow. in 1967. Especially, especially with that southern accent that you had, that southern draw, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love it. I did have a southern draw. You had a southern draw on that one. That that's, that's awesome. And I, um, yeah, I've been putting putting costumes on actors' backs for over fifty years now. Um, so I did theater for many years, and then I did commercials for years. And I didn't really start doing a lot of film until I came to Savannah. Really? So, so, so what, what brought you to Savannah then, you know, was it, was it the industry then? Or? No, no, not at all. I'm the fifth generation of my family to live here. Okay. All okay. of my father's family was Savannah Irish. And after his death, Alan and I came down here to visit a cousin who'd been at the funeral and just fell in love with it. I felt so at home. You it's know, so, I it's so easy to fall in love with Savannah. <laughs> it really but, is. You know, I spent a lot of time here as a child, but I'd forgotten all of that. And the way you see things as a child is so different. And for instance, I never knew that people got drunk at St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> we used to go to the parade yeah. and then we shifted off to Auntie's house and the adults went out. So well, uh, it, it is a religious holiday, but yes, yeah. the, the city takes a, a lot of liberties with the parade and it's a celebration of Irish culture. And, and uh, I remember growing up, it's, it, it was a lot more rowdy than it is now. It's more yeah. family oriented. When we have a parade, this was like probably one of the only times we didn't have a parade in the history yeah. of it because yeah, of so. of the elephant that won't leave the room, <laughs> and that's the pandemic. But I came back here in yeah. 2011, really just got fed up with the English winter and decided it would be really nice to live somewhere where we weren't cold all the time. And then... Uh, and I had only been here for, for a few months before mm -hmm. I was asked to work on a, on a film called Savannah. Okay. I've, yeah, I've, I've heard of that. That's yeah. like when you Google Savannah or, or film or whatever, that always comes up. And uh, so what was that experience like being in the, that film? Oh, um, it's a very well-made film. It was a bit of it was a bit of a struggle. It was low budget. I was just a playing on it, um, but the finished product is very good. And the director, who also wrote it, um, Annette Haywood Carter, very very good. Cool, cool. Um, so, what what stories can can either of you tell about some productions you've worked on? Uh, and I know, Alan, you're a producer, so you probably have a lot that you can say or maybe can't. Well, the thing is, Ed, that uh, I didn't start as a producer. Okay. I started by cleaning the toilet for a producer in New Bond Street, Old Bond Street, one of the prime streets in London, and he was testing me. He sent me down. He had five floors of cutting rooms, sound department, and that was what he asked me to do. I went in for an interview. Mm -hmm. And he thought, well, I'll see what this guy will say yes or no to. Sent me off with a bucket and a mop, and off I went. When I came back up to see him, he said, right, get your hands washed. I want you to now make a cup of tea, see what sort of tea you make. <laughs> and he gave me the job. That's, that is, that is I awesome. Lower than the lowest. And I, I remember telling my mum what I was earning, £2.70 a week. She said, it's not even going to get your train fares into there. <laughs> uh, so... So, uh, so you followed your passion, though. In the, in well, I, at school, I did an arts course. In. Mm -hmm. I was always interested in art. And it, 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 I think there's something inside you which drives you. How I got an interest in the film industry, my father worked for a camera company, W. Vinton, in London. And in those days, I'm talking about now the 50s, early 50s, we, the only cameras you could shoot movies on, and this is cinema movies were Mitchells. They're an American camera, but the British put a massive tax on them, an import tax. 
So yeah. cameras started to be built by other people, like the Rank organization had Rank, they had uh, their cameras. Vinton built a Model H, which was a copy of the, the big uh, Mitchell camera. And anyway, my dad was involved in that. He was also involved in building a 3D camera all in one, so that it was an all in one 3D camera. And he came to me one day, said, son, MGM are having a Christmas party. Would you like to go? L Street, where Stanley Kubrick made 2001. Wow. So I said, well, would oh, I? Yes. So, <laughs> and I walk in, and there's hardly anybody there. I think we got there early because it was a long way from home and it was difficult to get there. But the first guy I meet is about six foot five. It was a man called Harry Gillen. Harry Gillen. Mm -hmm. And he was a famous camera operator. And he said, well, you look like you could uh, do with something uh, to do, son. Want to come on the camera crane? I said, oh, do I? So <laughs> we got on this camera crane. We got straps on. and Off we went. Up and down, up in the lights, down. And that, that told me what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I wanted to be in, in the film studio and I wanted to be working on a camera crane and I wanted to be doing what he did. We worked on those great big, um, they were called Moy heads in those days. They're, they're two wheels that you have to turn and you have to learn to go backwards and forwards without thinking. And- uh, were, they, were they kind of like opposing? You know, that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you should be, uh, what they made you do was put a piece of chalk on the front and write your name on a blackboard or do a figure of eight. But you could do it in the end, you could do it in your sleep. You could just, you just watch the action and it, you, you just went where it was and it's totally smooth. So anyway, that was, that was the start of things. So I said to my father, well, that's what I want to do, dad. Well, he, he didn't think that was very really good. Like, that's not a proper job. <laughs> right? Exactly what they say, it's not a career. And I wasn't quite a good London, what we call a public school, you would call a private school. And I was at a very sort of quite an upmarket school. So it was not a job for a public school boy. You know, the way England works is it's called the old boy network. And when it came to leave, the, the master in charge of what we call the public schools appointments bureau said, there's an old boy running the stock exchange. And we think you'd be terrific on the stock exchange. I could do, I've always been able to do mental arithmetic in my head very quickly. I still can. It helps me with budgets, um, Ed, because I can see where they're wrong. I can't always tell you where the figure, I can just look at a figure and know it's right or wrong. So, um, that, where am I? Uh, so, I had to find a job. Nobody would help me. We had a street in Soho in London, and this is not south of Houston, this is Soho, London. It's a little square mile a bohemian square mile and I went up and down that street right into the evening knocking on doors and asking people for a job and I got to a company called Anglo Amalgamated Film Distributors and if Jim Reed watches this program which he probably does he will know them very well because he knows all those old filmmakers in London he's very he's very well versed in this anyway man answers the door said yeah who are you I told him who I was he said well what do you want it's six o'clock I said, well, I'm, I'm looking for a job. He said, J -j -j six o'clock in the evening, and knocking on my door looking for a job. He said, uh, where have you come from? I said, well, um, uh, North, North London. And he said, where were you at school? I said, haberdashers. He said, so was I. Come up. And this is how it works. This is how that old boy network works. I went up to the fourth floor, opened his door, sat me to Alan Keane. The man's name was Alan Keane. I remember it now. He's a very nice man, Scotsman. And I'm, I'm, nearly Scottish. So, so, so he gave me a job in the barring department of the distribution company. And barring is when you've got two cinemas, like the Lucas and the um, other theatre. Trustees. And the trustees. Mm -hmm. They won't, a, a distribution company will not hire the same film to the two cinemas. If you bar one cinema, it can have it maybe two weeks later. So that was a department. Mm -hmm. I hated it. I'd come out of an art department at school and I wrote with italic writing and I couldn't write within the little lines that they wanted me to. And I could see my days were numbered there. That night, going home on the train, I saw an ad for um, T-Boy. T-Boy wanted film company in London. So I immediately phoned them up. Phoned up, got through to the producer. The first thing he asked me, where were you at school? When I told him, he was, he was very impressed because a lot of his, where he lived, 
a lot of those people went to that school. It was a, it was a pretty expensive school. I got a free scholarship from the council. Otherwise, I'd never have gone there. Anyway, he gave me a job. He, first thing I did, I turned up and he said, go and clean these, go and clean these toilets out. Go and get a bucket in the mop. Clean out the toilets. I did go that. clean out the loo. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Five floors of it. Wow. Asked me a cup of tea. Uh, and then he's, I was 15 at the time. Oh. I'd left school at 15 because I started school a year earlier than anybody else. So I was in the sixth form. I don't know what you call that in America. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have it. It doesn't have it in America. Six forms where you're treated a little bit more as an adult. You're free. It's a bit like being at university, but being at kind of like uh, pre-university kind of yeah. In it, it, you, know, you have your own. You have your own room that you have. You know, and you. They didn't have fagging at my school, which I shouldn't really say. Oh, that's no, I won't go into that. <laughs> that happens at these public schools. You're given a younger boy, and he cleans your shoes for you and gets your tea. And Anyway, we won't, go, we won't go into all that. It does the same thing in America, does it? <laughs> no, no, no. We mean something different uh, <laughs> so, completely. Uh, so where was so, I? So I got a uh, job. Yeah, so you got the I job. Did nine, I did nine months there uh, in absolutely doing just that. Cleaning up, washing, doing, any, doing anything you were asked to do. Um, and suddenly, uh, we, uh, I started to befriend one of the cameramen there. And I knew I wanted to go in the camera department. And the name, man's name was John McCallum, who is still a friend of mine. He was, I, was a, I was then apprenticed to him. Basically, I became his dog's body. Instead of everybody's dog's body, I was his dog's body. Then another cameraman turned up called uh, Dick Bush, who became quite, fam quite famous in America. You could look his, on IMDB, Dick got a, ended up working for Bill Friedkin and various people. Um, and those two guys instilled in me, what's still in me now, never, never, ever bodge anything. If you can help it, don't bodge. Don't ever say that'll do. And I, that kept, stayed with me. Anyway, cut a long story short. I never went, say fix it in post. Either. Maybe it's uh, <laughs> kind of uh, close to that. <laughs> everybody says that. I don't ever remember saying it because there was no post when I was coming up through the there, camera there was department. No, there was no digital fix. There was no digital fix. There was no DIT, yes. Every time you hear those words, fix it in post, someone's got to pay for it. And it's normally the producer and it's not normally in his budget. And, and, he's, I, and he's, he or she is normally not happy about that either, spending more money than needs be. Well, he's not spending more money. It's, 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 um, it's, it's like Barbara... Um, broccoli says about the Bond films. We're not mm -hmm. doing so much CGI now. It's starting to look wrong. People are starting to doubt that we do this. We're going to shoot it for real from now on. And that's what they've done, I understand, from my pals who worked on the Bonds. Uh, oh, yeah, I didn't yeah. ever did one James Bond film. On, I did a film called On Her Majesty's Secret Service out in Switzerland. One, one of the best. <laughs> but, I mean, but I, I would great have Bond film. <laughs> I can but, tell you some stories about that movie. Oh my gosh! Um. <laughs> basically, basically, and in answer to your question, how do you how do you get in? How did I get in? You've got to have grit and determination. You've got to take every no, get out of my sight, uh, uh, until you eventually break it down. But the film industry is nepotistic. The father and son. Well, look, I've got two sons. One's an exec producer in LA. One works on the camera crane did five years on game of thrones um and i i did help him to get in i of course wanted violin playing brain surgeons but i let them <laughs> follow their own path and that's where it I, I was actually going to bring because you're talking about the nepotism or um well the industry is is changing and and and, and judith you're involved with uh swift which is uh, savannah and women in film and television which you're heavily involved in that um in fact a founder of it correct and we founded it i think it might have been 2013 <laughs> okay. um for four local film goddesses myself beth nelson Carla Schindler and Marion Green Hofstein, who is living in Atlanta now. Um, we were sitting around the table having a drink one night and saying, you know, we need to get the ladies of Savannah 
together so everybody knows everybody. I have been involved in with T, as it's called, the International in London, and both Carla and Marianne had been involved in LA. And so we just started our own little group here. And um, it's grown, it's changed. How has uh, it changed? Well, our initial reasoning was to try to get films to come here. And we did, immediately we did a database of all the lovely ladies working as crew. We, we only involved, we're only involved with crew. Mm -hmm. Mainly because um, producers never hire actors. Casting directors do. Right. So, producers well, just pay for them. We want to. <laughs> they pay for everything. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's so wanted, important. Yeah. We yeah. wanted to attract um, producers to Savannah by saying, look, we do have crew here. We do have a lot of crew. And as time has passed, Savannah and Beth Nelson have proved incredibly adept at getting the productions here. And now our focus is more on mentoring and teaching and bringing the young people in this community into the fold, into the actual crew positions. Yeah, the world is ch is changing, and, and and this is something that I wanted to touch on with you, especially being you're a pioneer for for women empowerment of women in the film industry, uh, especially here in Savannah. Being part of Swift, uh, an integral part of that, you um, are helping give an actual with the database and having having saying here's what here's the actresses we have here's the you know, directors or, wh or whatever, you know, screenwriters, whatever, you know, these are the women in film that Savannah has to offer. And I know there's the old boys network, but the old boys network is, is being chipped away because oh, absolutely. women, women are coming in and, and they're doing, they're doing it. They're making it happen. And, uh, and uh, more power to them. And uh, we're going to see, how do you see the industry changing? I, I see it changing dramatically, but in a, in a positive way. Um, we, we refer to it as the, great, as the new world. You know, we've started talking about, well, in the new world, this is going to happen. In the new world, that's going to happen, but that's not going to happen. And I think, I think there will be more emphasis on women on people telling interesting stories. I think there'll be less emphasis on whoever has the most money makes the best film. Uh, I don't think that's gonna be the case in the future. I, I think I distributors are going to play a smaller part because the movie theaters have been closed now for so long. A lot of those distributors have lost a lot of money. There's some doubt whether the AMC chain will even survive this. Yeah, that, that's a big fear because at least for us, for, for film uh, theaters, in, in Savannah at least, it's the only chain that we have. We, only, we yeah. have two of them. And, um, you know, we don't even have a drive through technically in Savannah. So you have to drive out to Pooler, which is just outside Savannah. And they have some independent theaters and an IMAX out there, but you know, who knows if they can stay afloat. I mean, no one foresaw that, you know, how things are going with this pandemic and, and how it would dramatically change. I, I feel like people thought it was just going to be a month maybe, yeah. and then everything would restart and it, it hasn't. It's been several yeah. months and it's, and it's tough. And I'm in a lot of the groups where I, I see actors and screenwriters, producers, directors, and, and they're always talking and, and they're all concerned. They're all terrified about when is it coming back and, uh, you know, what we can do. And, and I know that, um, that Georgia has put forth in the, the, the regional film uh, commission office there uh, with Beth Nelson and everyone, they've put together their guidelines of, of how we safely come back to set. And then I'm, I think it's the Directors Guild of America 
came out with it was it like a 37 page um, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. document and I read it and it's very extensive we've actually talked on a, a we broke it down on a couple shows back here on Savannah on film and like even one thing it came down to a friend of mine who was working in the office and we talk about an ink pen and for those who can't see this I'm holding up yeah. an ink pen now let's say you, you're in the you're in the you know next to me and you need your pens out of ink and I've got the only good pen right now I can't lend you my pen you know because we're social distancing we're we're learning all this and that but yeah I could be contaminating the next person yeah. You know, it's these crazy things you never think about. Um, one of the things I, I want to chat about, because we've got to um, take a, a quick break here. But when we come back, I want to talk about um, how, how you think we're going to proceed uh, personally. How do, you, how do you think we're going to restart? And, and, and what do you think some of the best practices are? So um, you are listening to Savannah on Film, and I've got uh, the fabulous Judith and Alan Moore here with me. And uh, we'll be back after these few announcements. So just stay with us, we'll be right back. Now you have a chance to support both Savannah Independent Artists and WRUU during this shelter in place order to stop the spread of COVID-19. Creatives in Need is a group of independent artists hosted by the Roots Up Gallery which is collaborating with WRUU during this shelter in place to offer an online art gallery at www.rootsupgallery.com. For every work of art sold at this online gallery, the artists receive 80% from the sales and 20% goes to WRUU and its programs like Art on the Air. Interested listeners can go to www.rootsupgallery.com to start shopping today. This is a message from the Georgia State Department of Public Health. Social distancing means minimizing contact with people. It also means that if you are near someone in public, try to stay at least six feet away. The less contact people have with one another means the less opportunity for the virus to spread. Slowing the spread of the virus means that we can keep our health care system from becoming overwhelmed. More information can be found at dph.georgia.gov. WRUU brings you the most diverse and passionate local radio programming on the air in Savannah. This all-volunteer and nonprofit community radio station accepts no money from any form of government. Our diversity and independence is made possible only through the generous financial support of listeners like you. We rely on your annual and ongoing monthly contributions to cover the many costs associated with bringing you our broadcast and web programming. If you are a contributor, thank you. If you're not yet a contributor, please show your appreciation of the role WRU plays in your life by becoming a contributor in any amount. You can donate quickly and easily by credit card or check. Just find the donate and subscribe links at WRU.org. Thanks for listening to and supporting WRUU. This is WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings community radio with global soul and we are back here on savannah on film i'm your host ed susevich here and we're on the fantabulous fantastical wreu 107.5 fm in savannah georgia here and we're also online at wruu.org and i'm talking with uh, two exceptional individuals that i know we're not going to have a lot of time to cover everything that, that we want uh, to talk about, but we're going to try. Um, I've got um, Judith and Alan Moore here. Um, Alan's a producer, and um, Judith it works in the costuming and wardrobe department. And before the break there, we were talking about how we restart the in industry. So, um, and this goes out to both of you guys. Um, what what do you, what do you, what are your thoughts about restarting the film industry, film and television industry? Well, I I've read part of the document that was put together, not just by the DGA, but by all of the film unions. Um, our local, which is IOTC four and our mom was very involved in that, and the Teamsters, 
and SAG, right. all involved in this planning. Um, it looks difficult, but not impossible. It involves a tremendous amount of testing. It involves zoning people. So it'll mean a lot fewer people actually on the set, but that's not a bad thing. Yeah, it's 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 going to cost probably a little bit more money for a production too to have yeah. those those health individuals. And um, we talked a little bit um, on last week's show with Michael Neal, a fabulous gentleman. Um, we talked a little bit about about it too, and um, in the logistics of of having a person like that, him him being a set medic and like marine coordinator and stuff like that, do the jobs blend? to this new position, this person that's going to take the temperatures, that's going to be in charge of everything. And so um, feel, I think it, uh, the consensus was that, you know, they're going to be separate positions, but definitely. Yeah. And um, because it's going to be hard to be the set medic and do, you know, that you have to focus on the, the job at hand and all that. Um, what do I feel, Ed? Let me just say what I feel. Yes, sir. I think until there's a vaccine, and until you've got a high speed test, I'm, di I'm diabetic. So if I want to test my GI, I'll prick my finger, I'll put it on the thing, it tells me exactly there and then. Right. Until that test is around. I spoke to somebody this morning at Pinewood, uh, Trevor Woods, the Oscar winning um, uh, special effects supervisor from, um, what was it called? The books, anyway, anyway. His daughter's a caterer there. And they're, they're supposed to be starting to shoot again next Monday. And this is one of the Jurassic Park series. So big budget. Right. And she got up there and they told her what she'd got to have to do. She said, well, it's going to take me two hours instead of an hour to, f to feed people. First, first thing a producer hears, well, oh, this isn't going to work. You know, uh, the th <laughs> I just don't understand how they're actually going to separate. What, how what? To how to make up people put the final touches on i have a right. question about this too i've seen this online too where um there was an article posted and, and i don't remember who the article was by unfortunately mm -hmm. but it it, it it generally talked about the long work days these 15 hour work days oh, you know place, that maybe place. there'll be 10 hours that that maybe it didn't work before and you know hollywood is going to change forever be, you know, maybe we'll have to go to shorter days and with all yeah. the social distancing, you're going to, it's going to put more production days, I imagine, on a film, especially sure. big budget films. But then, only the unions can change that because okay. we don't have a union. Margaret Thatcher made sure of that. We don't have any unions in England. We can virtually, producers can do what, virtually what they like. Um, we work what we call a, um, what do we call it? Total French uh, hours. French hours. You call it here, French ads. You, you, you go and get your meal and you eat it while you're working, okay? But you do a 10 hour day. And it's much more productive than it is stopping because to stop for a meal in the middle of the day, it takes you time to wind down. You then have your hour. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't have a half hour. Oh. We can have an hour meal in England. And then we got to wind up again. It's about an hour and a half, maybe an hour and three quarters before you really get going again. So if we could, if America could introduce French hours working, but this would only be the unions that, that would do this and then get a guaranteed 10 hour day, people would do a shorter day. I mean, I couldn't do the days that people do now. I've never, I did a complete- It is difficult, it is doing difficult. Doing one hour at a time on the film. I started at 8.30 in the morning as a camera operator and I finished at 5.30 and I didn't do one hour's overtime on that whole film, which was about nine weeks shooting. Wow. Uh, I'd love to go back to that. I hate these hours. Everybody would. Uh, I, I, there, there, are, there are so many. Uh, we've we had people talk on the show talking about safety even before the pandemic was a thing. And, you know, people that would, you know, they'd get the fratter days and, you know, <laughs> you'd work, you'd start on one day and you, you'd go well into the next day and almost the, the following day. Yeah. And I know the unions, you know, put, I, I, put, put, put a, put a clamp down on that. Yeah. So that, I'd like to see them clamp because we don't have that in England. We have a turnaround day. You work on a Friday night and work through to Saturday. You get paid for the Saturday as well as the Friday night. And that's fair because what can people do? They get home at four in the morning, get right. to bed by 
by sort of five in the afternoon, they're just coming around. The kids say, where have you been, Dad, all day? Oh, couldn't you take us out? So, no, well, you know, I, I really find that unfair. My son well, suffers a lot. I'm well, you bring up an excellent point about uh, – of family work and life balance. Yeah. And, and I think maybe this, I, I kind of thought personally when this whole pandemic came that it gave us a, all a chance. Cause we always said, I, do, I wish I had the time to do this. I wish I had the time to do this. And then all of a sudden, okay, everything stops. And then you've got almost all the time, almost in self seclusion with, you know, with the ones you love mm -hmm. <laughs> for several months. And now here's a chance to get those things done. And, mm -hmm. you know, and when the film industry really starts back up, I, I'm afraid my fear is the smaller productions, the non-union ones, the ones where people, oh, they're not necessarily gonna, you won't, you won't be able to police it per se you know, whether they're, they're social distancing enough or if they're, you know, doing proper testing. Because if you get to student films, you get to low budget or no budget films, who's going to really police that? And, and how do we know? Because do you see what I'm saying there that, that I'm afraid is that, that these films will start up and I'm starting to see, you know, hints of productions. Okay. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. There will be social distancing and they, they seem to be trying some of these, you know, smaller filmmakers, but it's these independent films I'm worried about that, that may cause an additional spread because, you know, and people may be doing the best they can, but when you can't afford for much of your crew, you know, if mm -hmm. you're non, you know, if you're an independent film, mm -hmm you can't afford for additional safety protocols. You can't, that's not going to fit into your limited budget. If you, you know, you've got a thousand dollars or, you know, 3000 or whatever you have, you know, or half of that to make a film. So I wonder how it's going to impact local filmmakers, the, the smaller filmmakers that, you know, are not big budget and they're not behind a studio. You know, I think the smallest films will start first. I think the first I do too. And that worries me will be small films and they will be made and they will be careful because what they can't afford to do is start and stop. Right. They and can't afford to lose any crew to illness. And so, yes, they are going to be careful. They may not be able to hit the guidelines that the unions and the big producers are asking, but they'll have smaller crews. They'll just have to be careful. So that that's hopefully the way it will go, and and because uh, I know when you when you're dealing with the unions, the unions are going to go by you know whatever the rules are, and they're not going to they're not going to let you bend the rules, you know, you know. Um, so we will see. I mean, it's it's still it's it's never been done before. It's it's like turning the computer. It's like turning off the starship. You know, it's like Star Trek. Yeah. You, you know, powering yeah. down the computer. No one's done a full yeah. restart, and they don't know yeah. how long it takes to restart. You know? Yeah, exactly. And, exactly. Uh, we do know there's not going to be nearly as much kissing. Yes. Do you find and, yourself watching things on TV now, and people are hugging and kissing, and you're going, ooh! <laughs> that is so funny you say that, because yeah, when the pandemic first started, I was doing that. I'm like, a, a film that had made a long time ago, and I was like, <gasps> They can't do that. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. You know, we're tra it's like we're trained already to, you know, be in isolation, you know. <laughs> and, we're, you know, we've got to find the happy medium that, that's safe for others. And, and it's not just taking care of ourselves. It's thinking about others, I think, you know. Um, wow. So uh, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about costuming and wardrobe because we're, we're, running, we're running very, very short on time here. Um, what, what do you love the most about? about working in like costuming and wardrobe and, and what are kind of the, the differences, similarities of those? I, mean, um, I just love costumes. I love costumes. I, I loved costumes when I was nine years old. I liked to come home from school and invent things to wear. The neighbors thought I was crazy, but um, I've been, to, I've been very, very, Fortunate to work with some incredibly talented designers. I love the process of design. Mm -hmm. um, it's changed a lot now and maybe not for the better. Um, it was, I love the days when designers drew pictures 
and not just shopped online all the time. Um, oh, the difference, the difference between seamstress and stitcher is that stitcher is the gender neutral, <laughs> the gender neutral term okay. for that okay. job. It used okay. to be seamstress tailor. Seamstress was always female and tailor was always male. Right. But some females were actual tailors and some men were actually so, stitchers. So now it's the right. there, There's terms in the industry because, yeah, we learned this coming up through film school. And I remember our wonderful instructor uh, telling us, he, he, he said to the ladies in the room and, he, and to everybody, he said, there are some terms for certain things we use. And I can't, I can't say them here on the radio, but... Uh, uh, Alan, you'll know, you'll know kind of what I'm talking about, but there, there's part in um, like grip and electric. There's different things that have different names, and you can't. Oh, I can't say those names right now on the on the on the air here. But you know, you, you wouldn't want to say those names, and 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 there because it was an industry built by men, you know, and yeah. it's a changing industry. And he said, so you'll have to forgive the the terminology on this. Is that you know the the industry is growing. It's 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 encompassing more people, more types of people. So, it, you know, these terms eventually will probably change to something. And, and that's, you know, that's fine. You know, it's 2020. And so, you know, we're evolving as a people, you know, and we're learning, you know, to respect each other and, 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 and looking through, I think, a new set of eyes, hopefully, at the world. I think, I think so, don't you, John? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to pivot back to you, Alan, because you, you, uh-huh. you, before we started talking, you mentioned something about Star Wars. And, and if anybody could see my eyes pop out of my head and I'm wearing a Star Wars <laughs> hat. Uh, um, <laughs> what was your, what was your uh, story about Star Wars there in a, a Pinewood? I think it was Pinewood. The only connection. No, it wasn't Pinewood because wasn't Star Wars it? actually filmed in Elm Street Studios. Um, I was, I had a very good friend, a man by the name of Eric Tomlinson, who's a music recording engineer, very, very well known in England, very well respected. And I think the producer's name was Gary, somebody of the first ever Star Wars. Anyway, Eric gave me a call one day. My office was in Soho, as I told you, um, I was in Soho, and he was working at Abbey Road. In fact, he was an Abbey Road sort of person. He was there for years. And he always handled the London Symphony Orchestra. That's a 90-piece orchestra. Right. Uh, who are, uh, only do three hours and then need a break, then another three hours. <laughs> it costs thousands to have them in. So anyway, he invited me down there to watch this. Jerry Goldsmith was the musical director and Gary was running the session. For some reason, the director wasn't there. I didn't meet, um, what's his name? Lucas. George Lucas. I met George Lucas at Pinewood when he came to actually shoot sequences of Pinewood. But anyway, I went down there to see this. And that's my one connection with Star Wars, except that Pinewood, Pinewood, before I left Pinewood, moved into Pinewood and made it their home and have done everything there since. The new Star Wars. The new Disney Star Wars, Star the Star Disney Wars. Star, Wars. Disney Star Wars. But I did meet George Lucas and I thought he was a very nice man. He talked very quietly. Roger Deakins, I think, was the cameraman that he was working with down there who was trained very near Pinewood, actually. Roger came from the Beaconsfield uh, Film and TV School. A studios that I used to work in when I was a boy wow. as a class. <laughs> it, it, it feels like Savannah's a, a big little city, you know, it's kind of, maybe it's kind of that way, like at Pinewood there. And uh, so, oh, so Pinewood, uh, Pinewood's nowhere. I mean, so, not Pinewood oh, in, in that area. In, I'm I was going to say to you, something we're talking about Pinewood and starting up again. Mm-hmm. You, Pinewood is an hour and a quarter drive from London, where a lot of people live in London. They've got to get to Pinewood to work. So a lot of them come by train to a station called Uxbridge. Pinewood runs a bus service from Uxbridge to the studios. Right. And I don't understand how you're going to crew your movies with riggers and sparks, electricians, that is, uh, construction people who don't want to drive and want to come on the train. I mean, you can catch this disease on the train coming to Pinewood. So you're there with it. If you're not tested before you go on the set, going to pass it to everyone on us on the crew sooner or later i really um think maybe the film industry is starting up too soon i'd hate to think that because i know a lot of people are hurting a lot of my friends and and the industry is going into a sort of decline because 
the streaming people have got content that they bought oh, years they ago. they are the film industry now. No, they? they're not the film industry now, Jude. They're not the film industry now. I mean, I've never, ever worked, Ed, on a, a digital camera. I've only ever shot on 35 or 70 millimeter all my life, or 16. But I've never worked, on, not, I've been on movies where I've been in the produ producing side, right. where, I've been, where it's been digital, but I've never actually looked through a digital camera and done any lighting or composed pictures through it. So, um, I don't know how I got round to saying that. that Ed, makes you know, you a I'm dinosaur. I'm a dinosaur, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a dinosaur, yeah. <laughs> but I'll tell you what. You, you may be a dinosaur, but but you have a wealth of knowledge, and you 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 did it the hard way. I mean, I feel like we have it e we have it much easier with technology, and you know you can instantly pull pull up something, and you can, you know, there was one film that was made. They were editing it while they were filming it. You know, and, and I mean, there's so many things you can well, that's do that now. Happened. I mean, uh, a yeah. crowd of mine, Ian Smith, was producing. Was that American producer that Ian didn't get on with? He stopped speaking to him after three weeks. Anyway, <laughs> he went home to his hotel and used to edit on Final Cut. Edit oh the movie and bring the cut in. But I could give you a good example about working on digital. A very good friend of mine, Phil Mayhew, who was a cameraman who photographed, he and I were both trainees at the BBC. We worked together just as two guys, two pals. Mm -hmm. And he comes here to Savannah and he's the cameraman on... Um, mainly because he knew Antonio Banderas because Phil had also photographed the two Zorro films. Anyway, mm -hmm. I'm standing there with Phil on the first day and he's in his little tunnel outside the, the Lucas Theatre and he puts the camera up, switches it on and then they've got this boat, they towed this boat through the shot and I heard the producer say, looks fantastic Phil ready to go and he said i'm sorry governor i haven't put any lights in yet i haven't done anything the producer had the screen coming straight out the camera and of course in the bright sunshine that looks perfect to them it looks perfect and phil said you know what al the game is up those very words to me and i know exactly what he meant by that when it was filmed it was a black art now everybody on the movie can see what you're doing where you're putting the lights. Well, when I, was, when I was on Galveston, that's, I was a GFA and as an intern, and I got yeah. the intern in the sound department. And, you know, of course, mind blown every day I, on, I was on set. I was like, oh, this is, this is so wonderful. And the film that I saw and the film that was the finished product, to me, were two totally different things. Okay. I mean, not totally different, but the tone was different, you know, and the editing and whatever, you know, not, not to say anything bad about the film, but um, you could see, yeah, I, I watched most of that film made. It was filmed in, I think, 25 days, it, and yeah. uh, I was on set 20 days. I think it allowed us 20 days on set, yeah. mm -hmm. and I was amazed, you know, you know, the technology is just so I, I like a lot of technology, but I, 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 I had to go to, I was going to being schooled on, on the new stuff. And, and I was like, you know, and that was, it was eye opening. It was mind boggling that you can do that. I mean, there are people that make, um, take their iPhone and make a, uh, <laughs> a film now. Or right. sure, in the better quality they get. But yeah. the, the right. reason you're saying that, and this is what makes me say about, being a cameraman, let's say being a director of photography, which is something I know about, because that's what I trained as for something like 20 odd years. Um, when you take your negative, which would be your digital imaging, into it to make your DCPs, which is the actual data transmission that comes out in the cinema, you have got so much control over that. You can make a bright daylight shot look like a night shot, you can make a night shot look like a bright day shot. No matter what, you just put your exposure in the middle of the spectral range. I may be getting a bit too technical now, but anyway, no, you, no, have a, have a curve, you have a curve which has got a one end of the bright sun, and down the bottom end is black. And you put your exposure in the middle, and that guy in a room in London, in a room in Soho, or in a room in Holly, yeah, Hollywood Boulevard, or somewhere in New York can decide what he wants, or the director can say, it's too bright, it was meant to be four o'clock in the afternoon, make it darker. And really it's taking the art of the cinematographer away. I'm not saying this is a bad thing, <laughs> but, but it's happening. 
and it's happening all over in the industry in in the movie business as well i mean you can you can uh oh, what you can't you do there's nothing you can't do well, I, I hate to cut it short here for the radio, but we're going to have to go for the radio portion of this, but I invite everybody to go on to YouTube and watch the premiere of this on Savannah on Film on YouTube, and, and we're going to continue the conversation, but we're going to wrap it um, for the radio right now. So I want to thank uh, Judith. Uh, it's It's been a privilege to have you on the show. I, I'm glad we could finally, it might have yeah. took a pandemic to get you on here, but I'm glad exactly. you're here. <laughs> and and uh, um you're, you're a wonderful person and and i remember when you came to the georgia film academy and you spoke and i was like hanging on every word you had to say about costuming and wardrobe which i knew nothing about and i, I learned a lot and you just came one day and talked and i was amazed and i said i've got to have that lady on my show and then i didn't know there would be a radio show but i'm i'm glad to fulfill that bit of a dream well and, you should know it what you should know is Judith is an expert on Shakespearean costume. Ah. Shakespeare, Shakespeare. What well, she we'll, doesn't... we'll definitely talk about that. I love some Shakespeare. So we'll, well talk about that on the video. You should, go to a, you should go to a Shakespearean show with us, the Globe Theatre in we London. We should do this again. We should definitely do this again. The, the door is, is wide open for you. And Alan, I, I, you, you bring such a great knowledge um to this you guys are a power couple I, i'll tell you it's, it's awesome um but anyway i want to thank everybody for joining us here and like join join us on, um for the rest of the video if you want to find out because we got a lot more to talk about so anyway thank you for listening here on wruu and i'll uh roll the outro here and and uh thank you for listening to Savannah on film i'm your host ed susevich and with, with uh my guest judith and alan moore thank you You have been listening to another episode of Savannah on Film, where we give a voice to the Savannah film community. Please like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Twitter. This program was originally broadcast on 107.5 FM in Savannah, Georgia, and worldwide on www.wruu.org. Join us next time for more intriguing insights into the vibrant Savannah film community here at Savannah on Film. And we are back here on Savannah on Film. I'm your host, Ed Susevich. And if you're watching this, uh, welcome to YouTube Savannah on Film. And I've got with me uh, the wonderful Judith Moore and Alan Moore. Um, they are uh, a couple that's been together um, a long time. <laughs> 42 years. 42 years. That's incredible. Um, that's, that's awesome. And um, we are talking about a lot of a lot of stuff here. Um, Judith is uh, just to bring everybody up to speed. If you're just joining us now, Judith, um, she works in the costume and wardrobe department in the film and television industry. She is a fantastic individual with a wealth of knowledge. She's worked on several films. Um, I've got I've got a list here in my notes. Here it's a long list. I think twenty five. I think 25 projects in Savannah. Yeah, I mean, let's see. Just just to name a few, uh, Birth of a Nation, which was a fabulous film. Yeah. Very powerful film. I agree. My favorite. Uh, um, Dear Dictator, that was with... Um, yes. <laughs> Michael Caine. Michael Caine. I, I was thinking of Batman. I, you know, I'm thinking uh, the butler, the butler. <laughs> yeah. know, the wonderful Michael Caine. Super talented. Um, she she's worked on Peanut Butter Falcon, which is a, a oh, yeah. brilliant film. I I really yep. enjoyed that film. Um, a film that that we didn't get to see to the total effect. Um, but Jim and I, man, with Will Smith, and uh, Michael Neal was on last week, and he was talking about 
we talked about the famous scene where Will Smith, when he was starting, I think his uh, Instagram or one of his social media accounts, and he had his first run in with our sand gnats. <laughs> and, and, you know, and so, and he said they spent so much time shooting that whole sequence and, and all that. And it ended up getting cut from the movie after all of that, which happens in film. But, um, so, you know, so, some great stories there. Um, she's worked on um, Live by Night, which you were seamstress on. That's a, an Affleck film. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and so many other ones. Um, and uh, so you, you said that um, Birth of a Nation was your favorite that you worked on? I think of all the films I've worked on, I enjoyed that, that the most because I so loved the director. Nate Parker, brilliant director, brilliant writer, I, and so uh, involved, so involved. Um, but I, I also, I have to put my hand up to being the costume designer for Abraham Lincoln versus the zombies. I saw that. That was, <laughs> that was fun. I, I enjoyed that. That was made in 15 days. Wow. For, in the end we had about 250,000 and it was you know there's a whole group of people in the savannah film business that when things get rough look at each other and go we survived the zombies we can do this. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I mean, we all, we have, we have those films, you know, we, I've done some films that I cringe at. I'm like, oh, I was out there. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. some films that I've totally done. I like, I will do that for free. I love that script so much. Um, you know, there's, and you have those ones in between. It's always, they're like, they're like guideposts in our life. You know, each film you can, you can track like, you know, if you have your kid, your kid was, you know, you had the oh, first yeah. kid during this film, the second kid, yes. you know, came later, you know, you were married during this or, yeah. you know, or, you know, good or bad things. Um, I've known some people that we talked earlier on the, on, on the radio, on the first part of the video here on, and on the show about, the long hours and how COVID's changing may change the structure, you know, may change us from these 16 hour days to maybe, you know, a 10 hour day. We'll see if that actually happens, but uh, with all the temperature checks and protocols that might, it might have to be just to, just to get 10 hours of filming in, you know, or even if you get that, but, but with all of that, you know, um, I forgot what my point was. <laughs> I don't know. I was going around and around. Can I just say, uh, um, Ed, which yes, sir. Is, a guy like Nate Parker making Birth of a Nation to me is the ultimate filmmaker. The guy took a book and wrote the script. He then raised the money for the film. He then got the actors together. He acted in it. He directed it. He produced it. He then took his. He, he edited it. He then took his final film to Sundance and sold it at a very good profit, paid everybody back. This is what the French call the auteur. Yes. I don't know whether you've ever heard that term. It's what the French fight for. They oh. do not want anybody interfering with their movie. You know, basically, Nate made that film. And I saw him the other day acting. What was the film we saw him in acting? Very good. Arbitrage. In, arbitrage. An exceedingly good actor. And I'd love to see him do some more, but the press got hold of him and they virtually destroyed that, that film. Um, but yes, we do Why need more. Why not go there? Why we not go there? Need, it's something that affected the movie, we need, isn't it? We need more people like Nate, who was totally committed and totally committed to his crew. He didn't really have enough money to do. We just didn't have enough money to do what we did, but we got it done. Um, he came back to Savannah after we finished filming here mm -hmm. because he so wanted to have a scene in a cotton field and we were here in the wrong season. And so he came back and d did his shot in the cotton field. Um, I think in the new world, I think it may be that we work shorter hours, but each film takes longer. Right. Which... I yeah, I think we may need to do... Will that more. cost more money? It, I, I think it will. It will cost more money in some ways, but 
we have to find those economies by working smarter. Working smarter. I, I do want to say something as a personal opinion of mine, uh, of Birth of a Nation. Um, because I had some other people work on it that I know. Uh, one one of my friends who's been on this show several times, uh, Patrick Roper. He had a he yes. just had a part in it, and he's a, he's a brilliant actor. And um, but that film was a moving film for me. It it touched me on a deep level, oh, and yeah. I know there was the controversies. I don't really want to get into the specifics of that. We all kind of know what happened or whatever, but it's it. I don't want to say that it's a shame to make, to make light of any of the, you know, the accusations or whatever, but that was a film that I felt like if it came out today would be even more powerful. And it would, oh, and it was a powerful film at the time and it didn't get as much recognition as that film should have gotten. It, it's, it's a brilliant film and it's, well, it got um, recognition at Sundance. It just didn't progress. Right. Um, Nate said to me that he knew he wasn't making a great film. He said, look, it's my first film as a director. I know this isn't going to be a great film, but it's an important one because right. it's a story that has to be told. And what that film is really all about is whose history? Whose history? Exactly. When people talk about history and, and ruining history or whatever, whose history? Nate went out and found the story that hadn't ever been told. What really happened? What it's, really happened? It's like the other film that's, that was supposed to come out, and Patrick was in this, and I'm not trying to just plug Patrick here, but, but <laughs> this is in line with what we're talking about. But Emperor, that was shot here, and um, yeah. we had some wonderful, um, we talked recently um, about the film and, and he had a, a wonderful experience on that film and it's such a powerful film and I wish because of the pandemic, it literally was like in March it was going to be released and it got pushed, pushed up to try to make the premiere. Days before the premiere. Right, then, then, yeah, then everything shut down. And, and it's unfortunate because I really wish that film could have come out in the climate that we're going through now. And, you know, this awakening, I think that, that the collective awakening that people are having about social issues and, and, and such. And, uh, and, and, and I think it would be so powerful. And I think Birth of a Nation, you know, had, if it were to come out today, that's a, that's a film I, I would say people should see. It's, you know, for being his first film directing, he did a wonderful job on it. I, I enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, it, because it, it is a tough subject and we don't need to too much in Hollywood. Personally, I think has been swept under the rug. It's time to, to take that rug and throw it out and, and you know, replace it yeah. with something else. And, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, the truth will come, will come out about everything and 2020 and going forward. I think we're going to, we're all going to look at cinema a different way. I think if anything, this pandemic has made people appreciate the art of cinema because we've literally had everybody in the industry had our livelihoods snatched away from us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when we come back, I think like you, Judith, when, when I, when I, I had my misgivings about maybe the, the smaller budget, or lower budget films coming back, you know, that they might kind of, you know, scoot the rules of, of social distancing and different things to get it done. But when I think about it, those are some of the most passionate people that are making films and they don't want to lose that opportunity to make those films, to get their voice out there, to get, to get it on film. And, and so I think people are going to take those extra precautions. I think people, I think you've changed my mind a little bit, you know, and, uh, and and I hope you're I hope you're completely right on that, and uh, I hope people are responsible. But in this climate, not just with the pandemic, but with all the social issues going on, and 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 the terrible things that have you know happened that have been brought to light because of the Me Too movement, I think we're seeing we're going to see a lot more openness and transparency in Hollywood and how biz businesses actually run. And we're going to get a lot more people coming up in the industry that are going to make sure that we don't go back. You know, maybe we do yes. need to go forward. I think we do need to go forward. In fact, you know, in, in a, in, in, in a better, well, more transparent way. I'm passionate about increasing the crew in Savannah organically. 
by training up young people, yes. by giving young people. I want to try. I want to teach people what I know before I forget it all. And I think the GFA has been brilliant at that. I think the whole interning issue is brilliant. I think that's the way we can make Savannah better. I think that's the way we can ensure an ongoing film business here is to have new people coming in all the time and getting better and better at their jobs. But the little films, we have to hold on to the little films because we have to they invest. Have we have to put skin in the game. You know, yeah. somebody has to have the guts to, to, to read a screenplay and say, okay, I'm going to give you a couple thousand dollars or whatever, which is a lot to a little film. You know, you can, you can, can well, if you're in LA, you know, a couple thousand yeah. won't make you a film. Maybe 10,000 will make you a film. Oh. <laughs> it might get you a commercial. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, there has to be, there has to be a way other than, than just the 48 hour that film competition which is wonderful but, the, but the, we have to invest in local stuff and in local filmmakers and, and and one of the purposes of this show has always been to put it that i i'm able to give a spotlight to a lot of filmmakers not just seasoned veterans like you guys that that have wealth of knowledge and experience but for those that are up and coming that might not get that spotlight, you know, to have their first film, you know, cause you're going to fail on your first film. You're going to, you know, you, you're not going to hit a home run all the time. Every time you go up to bat, you know, you're going to strike out, you're going to, you know, miss a few, but, but I want to see that homegrown Savannah, not just the productions coming here and using our resources mm -hmm. and our people and 98% of what's on the invoice comes out of Los Angeles. Yes. You know, that needs to be like 50%. We need a sound stage and we need to, we need to stop yeah. letting all these buildings go empty. You know, we have a theater in Savannah that's empty. That's going to become, um, I think a storage building, you know, um, what? which is that? Uh, the, well, that's, that's the last I heard. So, I, you know, it could have changed, but Regal, they closed down months and months before the pandemic. You know, it, it closed down the Regal by Savannah Mall. No, the Regal is out behind Savannah Mall. Yes, it? yes, by Savannah Mall. Yes, well, that's, that's that one closed down a while, and right next to the we AMC. Didn't we film them there for the act? I think we may have filmed them there for Did the you? act that's after it closed. Yeah, and, and see, that's the thing is that would make a great, like I've said before, that would make a great like indie theater or place to try out some yeah. of these local films you know a dedicated space i wish i wish i had the millions to to do but that or whatever it takes you, ed you've got two cinemas in broughton street which mm -hmm. are better actually than a lot of london cinemas i love oh. going to them i love going to those big cinemas one of those could show indie films i don't know why it's dark a lot of the time i mean i don't know how they run them how their profit and loss mark you know accounts work but i would love to see indie films um i mean i go to the uh, to thomas's um shows at the what's it the cultural center it's at the at the new uh yeah the new culture and it's center. a great little theater but i'd love him to run a french series with chabrol agnes father all those people that i jean-luc godard um and and the cameraman um raul cotard that i've modeled my own life on really wow. uh, i'd love to see a series it's like a that showing series there. people people would go to those i'm sure they'd go because but, you but know, it's about it's about building and it's also it's about building that that industry like you were saying judith it's it's building building the credible people so when productions come to town yeah. they don't just you know snatch up the latest union person or the latest whatever yeah. you know or they say we haven't you know you always hear it's the back and forth, you know, it's the chicken and the egg kind of thing where we don't have enough trained crew, you know, or, you know, you don't, you don't have enough here, you know, because and we need more. Because if we, you know how movies, movies are made, you, you, you get a producer, the producer hires a director, the director tells you which cameraman, which editor, it, all the key crew are going to come with those people. They're not gonna. They're not gonna come here and say we've got. We've no, got a I know. Like Ang Lee, that's the example I use. Um, you know, Ang Lee yeah. is gonna. You know, he's a cinematographer. He's gonna bring his crew with him. He's gonna bring uh, his sound crew. But he's gonna bring his key crew. Exactly. But what the 
Banner needs a lot more of is, is I mean, I mean there's films I've worked on, I've got 300 people on the crew. They don't all come from, you know, they can't all come from LA. You're not going to fly that lot in from right, LA. Right. But you want people from here. With, and this is what the GFA, John, is trying to do. I just feel that the GFA don't always advertise or t advertise correctly. If I was running the GFA, I'd put an ad in the paper and say, are you a rigger? Do you put scaffolding up in the high street in Broughton Street? Are you a decorator? Are you a construction man? Can you construct a house? You ever worked on any houses? Are you a bricklayer? Are you a painter? That's the sort of crew that, that will get hired to start with. They'll move on from there. I mean, we're, I had a friend. I had a friend who came through GFA with me, and he struggled. He really wanted to be a cinematographer, and he he got to work on the camera a little bit, but yeah. not as much as he wanted to. And then he went out and and he, he didn't have a lot of money to begin with, and he bought a, a decent camera, you know. To, but then he had yeah. to kind of sell it, you know, because he couldn't afford to really have the camera. And, and so he, he went back to construction, which he was doing yeah. and he went one day and it's kind of like your situation where, you know, you're, you're, you're cleaning the toilets or whatever. He went and, um, it was for a series that ended, it might've been, it might have been underground, the series underground. And he yeah. went there and he worked like an extremely long day and just cleaned up. And then he made connections with a guy and now he he's in the union. He's making good bucks last I heard. And, wow. uh, and he's, he's working. I think, I, I don't know if he's in the camera department, but he's on his way. Well, and, that's but he had because this long no, period of time where nothing happened. There's he, no shortcut to being a DP unless you've got natural talent. Now, how many natural talents are around? Roger, uh, what, did we, what did I tell you about Roger? Roger Deacon, a natural talent. I worked with some natural talents myself. Some of them were 60, 70 years old. Jeff Unsworth, who did the photography for Cabaret, just about one of the most perfectly photographed films I've ever seen, uh, as a cameraman talking. You know, I knew him. I only knew him vaguely. But um, you, you have to train to do this job because, you know, you make a mistake. It costs the producer thousands. It costs the movie thousands. You've got to go back and film it. <laughs> You just let your star fly off to Hollywood that night. Oh, come back. Imagine what the agent's going to say. Their agent. This is where, and this is why it's such a long process getting. Up there. there are people who come out of SCAD probably who are really good. We knew. Um, oh, but you're still, you know. Oh, yeah, they, they, they put out, they put out some great speed. The trouble with SCAD people, they don't, they don't stay here. Yeah. But there is no, there, there really is no substitute for the ability to work hard. That says it right there. That's true. That's true. You've got to hone your craft and you've just got to practice and practice and practice. I talk to several actors that tell me that all the time. You never stop learning. You never stop pushing. Absolutely. I think that's you know. true of every department. Yeah. I never stop Absolutely learning. Absolutely true. Every person I've ever worked with taught me something. Yeah. Everybody. Every time people, I work on a production, I learn something, and people look up to me, and I'm, I'm, I'm. They don't know, but I'm looking up to them too. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and uh, that's. I don't think we do enough mentoring. You know, like when you when you've got it to that next level, and personally, yeah. I feel you have a responsibility yeah. to share your knowledge to 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 help that next person up. If if that person showing that they're dedicated to it, not yeah. just, you know, Oh, I want to try this. You know, yeah. if, they, if you see the dedication and I've been able to give opportunities to people, you know, um, paid and unpaid, you know, or, or help them get them on a production at the very least, you know, but it's gotten them experience regardless, you know? And so that's, that's the thing is mentorship. We need, we need more of that, but we need, we need infrastructure as much as we need, these crews we need a big sound stage we need something for grip and electric you know. that is going to happen but when who knows i've been involved with this sound stage building and uh, you know beth and i sort of sit and talk about it but it, it, it probably will happen the, happen. the fairgrounds that came and went seemed like a good well, opportunity that's, that's, come that's come back on let's come back on let's come back on Okay. Yeah. Well, you have well, to keep us updated on that. You know, I'm sure I hear the chatter about it, but there's always somebody talking about, yeah, this is coming and that we're doing this and we're doing this. And, and then it just seems like it, it disappears. I must say the pandemic did put the, has stopped 
the major film studio that was oh. going to be, or the major stages that were proposed to be built here. But so you know, I, I look at somebody, and not to cut you off, I'm sorry. No, but no. Like um, Tyler Perry, what he's done mm -hmm. and what he's doing. Um, I mean, I'm not a major fan of his films. I mean, no. I, I don't think they're, they're Oscar worthy. <laughs> films uh, he hasn't got I, to that point yet of filmmaking in my in my uh personal belief yeah. but i like how he's giving back to atlanta how he's invested oh. in all these sound stages and oh. he he's building that village almost you know to yeah. bring the people you know in. how big it is you know how big it is and it's 600 acres it's, duncan it's, my it's, son went down there's 12 sound stages and Dunk said they're wonderful to work at there's so much space down there i That's mean it's amazing it is, Great studio, and, and we would we would kill for just one, <laughs> just yeah. one in Savannah. Would be yeah. the, we're not asking for much, you know. I, 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 when when I head downtown, I pass a building, and I don't know. It's 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 a building. It used to be blue. I, I think they painted it, but it's been for sale for like six months. And every time I pass, I'm like, that would make a great soundstage. <laughs> you know, when I'm driving by the theater that's closed in, I'm like, that would make a great you know dollar theater yeah. or you know yeah. an in indie theater or you know my, my big dream is let's say that i had a somebody dropped millions of dollars in my lap i, I would buy savannah mall i would totally well i would say i would tyler perry it basically yeah. i would turn that thing into soundstage and offices everything you need then i'd have the the little regal right across from it and yeah. I, and you could screen your films there you know test screen your films literally in a theater you know i'd you know, there's things you can do, you know, it's, it's just, I, I feel like Savannah is close to that. We, we got to make that next step. We got to make that next yeah. investment. And, and now of course, with the pandemic come that's come on, that's put everything in a screeching halt and, and, you know, everybody's holding it on to their, their, their uh, purse strings or whatever, you know, their money, then they're, you know, being reserved about things. But uh, I know we talked about like, the new digital world and how film's done and, and, you know, versus how it was done. And, you know, maybe, do you think, um, Alan, do you think that we are moving into an era where we don't need as much like brick and mortar as much? I mean, or, or, or is that a fear that we, we go to digital? In terms of studios. Yes. You need more, Ed. You need more. Anymore. The way studios are going is they're doing everything indoors now. They're building massive stages in Europe. My friend, uh, David Godfrey, who was the boss at Shepperton and Empire Mood and goes around the world building studios, is building bigger and bigger because all these explosion sequences and all this stuff is being done indoors. It's under your control. It's actually cheaper and easier in the end because... You can control um, the whole environment. Well, I just, I just heard on um, Monday that... Um, that um, there are no more filming permits in uh, Savannah at the moment. They've, they've, they've stopped any filming permits. Well, that's just because of the pandemic. Yes, I know why. I know why it is. But if you've got stages, you just say, oh, we're going to do it in the stage. I mean, I've seen, I've seen a complete town built in the big 007 stage. What was that? Mary Riley. It was a film we shot at Pinewood. And I went in there. They had horse, horses and carts. And it was meant to be... a um, uh, Victorian England wow. and it was ginormous but they had it under their control it was totally they didn't have to worry about rain every day they kept on schedule and it, to, to a lot of degrees it is much easier working in a studio than it is working on location you don't have to move 30 trucks you don't have to find somewhere for them to go you don't have to put up 30 toilets for your crew you've got it all there and you can and it's because the film industry whatever you say or think Ed, it's a business it's a business at the end of the day. Even if you're making Jean-Luc Godard films and Claude Chabrol films in France, they're a million and a half pound budget. And, and people laugh at that. They say, they say to me, million and a half, is that all you've got? I said, well, you go down the bank and see if the bank manager will lend you a million and a half. You exactly. see how hard to raise a million and a half. Somebody said to me the other day, I talked about a script that I got. And he said, you know, Alex, it's easier to raise 50 million than it is to raise five. Absolutely right, because 50 million represents a big profit to the studios. Five million might represent 
a tax yes. write off. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, we lost five, you know, 5,000. <laughs> this is where it, it, to me, nobody gets staked today. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, it's I mean, actors are paid massive salaries. Right. Because, well, I think we're seeing we're seeing a lot of those. There's only a few names that you can open a film, and even that's hit or miss. I mean, there's Tom Cruise. Uh, I'm a big fan of his, not just Tom, because of the action films he does, but because he he's in on the business side of it, and the the the, the, the executive well, producer he side. He and Paula Wagner, who own virtually own the um, uh, what's the franchise? Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible. Right. Uh, a pro the producer in the next office to Judith and I, because Judith used to work with me in production at Pineworth, so not, not only does she know about um, costume and that, she knows about production. She handled the financial side of a lot of my work because I worked abroad so much and I'd just go for long periods. Anyway, Paul Hitchcock was producing the first of the Mission Impossibles and, and the first and second. And um, Paula Wagner and, 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 and uh, Tom Cruise controlled it because they own, I presume they bought the rights to it. And um, those films made massive profits. He once said to me, um, Tom, uh, I don't know whether this is true or not, but maybe I, I shouldn't, well, I, I will say it. He told me that Tom Cruise earned 85 million out of the first one, and he said something. He said, how much money does, it, does anybody really need, Alan? <laughs> and then he had to go yeah, to Australia. Yeah, don't say that out loud. <laughs> Tom, Tom Cruise, right. Uh, Nicole Kidman, and they moved it to Australia to shoot it because Nicole and she was shooting, she was shooting something there, and he wanted to be there, so they went, they went to Australia to shoot, and came back and were very disheartened. And I don't know, I think Brian De Palma directed the first one. Didn't but, but Paul Hitchcock, who produced the first one, mm -hmm. he did say this to me one day. I said, "Paul, what do you look for in a kind of entry level position in in England? It's called runner here, it's called PA." Uh, what do you look for when you hire somebody like that? And he thought about it for a minute and he said, good manners and a clean driving license. Yep. I won't have anybody on my set that doesn't have good manners. And then he said, I do like graduates, but I like graduates who've done either English or history. People who've done English know how to write, and people who've done history know how to research. So I'm glad they're not looking for math because I would never get hired. <laughs> I, I jokingly say that this is a math-free zone because <laughs> I'm atrocious at math. When I used to go to the uh, production meetings at Pinewood, there was the Production Guild. It's like the Production Guild in America, PGA. Well, we had the Production Guild of Britain. And one producer said to me, um, Always get ex-army people, Alan. They know how to get up in the morning, turn themselves out, and they do things without questioning. And I found that to be quite true sometimes. You know, depending on what your work, what they're doing on your movie, but there are a lot of people that actually question you when you ask them to do something, and and that takes time, and you've got you've got to respect their well, opinion. Um... I, I, I've had a guest on my show here. Um, he's a friend of the family too. Uh, my mom used to work there. Um, she's since passed on years ago. But Stratton Leopold, he, yeah. he uh, yeah. worked on a Mission Impossible Three, and the man loves his ice cream, and he's a fantastic gentleman. He's just, you know, yeah, I, I, I call him the Godfather of film in in, yeah. in, in Savannah. You know, he worked tirelessly for the industry here, and. Uh, and he was telling me about Tom Cruise's work ethic and he's like, Absolutely. we're going to do another take. We're going to, he's like, we're going to do, he said, and um, I had a, another gentleman, I'm not trying to name drop here, but, no. but he was on the show before, but William Mark McCullough worked on American yeah. made with Tom Cruise. And he told the story on the show here, how uh, when they were going down to, forgive me, I don't know if it was Columbia or somewhere <laughs> South America. Columbia. Okay. Yeah. And, and they, and they, and they, they were like, they clapped for him when he, when he was, I think in Atlanta or wherever they were filming and he said, okay, he's done. And Tom's like, where's he going? Um, he, he's coming with me and you know, him and the producer had to go have a chat and he's like, you know, I'll walk. I don't know if he would have walked off the film, but you know, I'll walk if he doesn't come, you're going to fly him to such and such. And they did. And, uh, that impresses me when an actor will 
that has the clout, but who will also stick his neck out and will go to bat for an actor because he knows it's good for the film, you know, yeah. because he worked, they worked so well together in those scenes that they were in. And, um, you know, I, so he gets, he always gets respect for me. And Tom Cruise does because of, you know, not just that, but you know, the fact that he works really, really hard at it. And, you know, I'm afraid one day we're going to catch him, you know, the last thing that he ever does is going to be on screen. It's going to be a stunt. Oh God, no. And, and I, I pray it isn't. And I can't wait for the next, I think the mission impossible films personally are, I love them and, and they're getting better and better, I think. And mm -hmm. I just, um, I can't wait for the next couple of them. Cause I know that I think it's seven and eight or six and seven in the series were pushed back, you know, into next, both of them into next year and the following year mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. And Mark's film, Mark's film is going to be made soon. A haunting yeah. in Savannah. Mark and uh, Alexis came and spoke to Swift. Once a month, Swift has a speaker. We're mm -hmm. having to do it on Zoom at the moment. But yeah. Alexis, Mark's, uh, partner came and um, and told us all about it. It sounds fantastic. They're waiting until they can do it properly. They're waiting for in, until they can satisfy the guidelines for reopening. Well, that's smart. Um, that's, you know, you got to be respectful of the crew and you got to be respectful of everybody. And it take those things take time. Yeah, you know, and, and, that's and what they're doing. And, you know, you got to be careful because sometimes, you know, with this crazy disruption in the industry, you can lose funding on, on projects. Yeah. And there's, there's probably a lot of films uh, that, that, that won't get made. But I'm kind of hoping that since the big budget films aren't out there in theaters, that when theaters open up and they don't have anything to show, maybe yeah. they'll show something that's a little bit more local, you know. They they started tracking the box office again, and and there were some films that were playing at drive drive-ins only, oh, yeah. which you know I was like I wish I could I could bring a drive drive-in back. You know I wish I had the money yeah. to do that. I would do that. And we used to have one on Seventeen uh, Highway Seventeen down that way, and had a couple in Savannah there's going one in way back. Yeah, there's one. and there's one in Jessup, Georgia. Yeah. Um, or the, I think the closest here, but you know, they're even at half capacity, they're selling out, you know? Yeah. And, and, and like, I, I know I saw online Garth Brooks where I, I had tickets to go see Garth Brooks and that's been pushed back, but now he's doing a special drive-in thing. And oh, he sold, well, he sold, they had 300,000 people in the queue just waiting to buy tickets uh, draw, and it's going to, I think it's the end of this month or it might've already happened because it's July now or almost July or whatever. <laughs> um, and so he, he's going to try something else to add another day or something, but he literally like sold out drive throughs So people are going mm -hmm. back to drive throughs So there were, there was one film that was a horror film and it was, I, I never even heard of it and it probably never would have gotten the light of day, but it played at some of these drive throughs and it, and it registered enough box office, you know, yeah. might've been, I don't know, $10,000, but it was the number one film for like three or four weeks, you know? So maybe, you know, I'm hoping maybe the little films will get back, you know, the independent films and, the, and you know, we'll find a diamond in the rough that we might have not seen had it been a big blockbuster tentpole movie. Mm. Though, though I can't wait to get back to see, to the theater experience. I never want it to go away. I could live in a theater. I would be happy in a theater, you know? And, uh, I just, I just have always loved film. And so it's just that communal feeling, you know, when you're sitting there and especially like I'm a big star Wars fan. So you go opening night, that's when you go, you know, you go to the very first show and those are where the hardcore fans are there. They're either going to hate it or they're going to love it. There's no in between. <laughs> and uh, just like a lot of films, you know, you go, even, even if they're, even if they're not blockbuster films, it's, it's just, it's, it can be in the theater can be such an intimate thing that you don't get at home. You know, you don't get by pausing it and going, you know, the convenience of pausing it and getting something else to eat or whatever. Yeah. You have to sit there. You have to commit two hours maybe to a film. Um, if you really love it and it's three hours long, you'll commit three hours to it. <laughs> but um, there's just something about the cinema and being there. And I'm, I desperately like a lot of my friends, we miss that being in the cinema and watching films, you know. Yeah, sure. And, I'm being uh, in a, I mean, actually, 
But the last two times we went to Thomas's shows in the cult cultural centre, they were mm -hmm. packed. And there was a yeah. wonderful buzz in there. He showed Parasite. And then what was the second one we showed? He showed? That was a phenomenal film. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he like... showed um, Antonio Banderas. Oh, film. wonderful. Absolutely wonderful film. <laughs> Oh, mm. Almodovar. Almodovar. Okay. I can't remember, I can't remember the, I wasn't going to pretend I could know the name of that. <laughs> but I, yeah, I remember it. And then he showed us every short that was nominated for the Oscars, which nobody ever gets to see. One night, I think one night we saw all of the live action and the next night we saw all of the animation films. I think one time like the local theaters had like a thing where you could watch them all, but it was like one specific time and it was, and it wasn't promoted at all. So you, you didn't know unless you stumbled across it at social media. I saw it on social media after the date <laughs> and I'm like, had I known I might've gone see, you know, and seen some of those, you know, shorts and cause you know, a film doesn't have to be two and three hours long to be great. It, it can be two and three hours long and it can be terrible. You know, it all starts with the story and it's, and it's how compelling you bring that tale to life on the screen. So I, I just can't wait till we, we all get back in that mode where it's safe. I was, I was in a meeting um, one night at Pinewood and the Producers Guild and we were talking about budgeting and what film made. Now there was a little film made, um, what was it called, the guys who did the strip? They, they, you know, got up and danced. So oh, that's the full Monty. The full Monty. Oh, the full Monty. Three, it's three a hilarious half, film. <laughs> half million. It eventually grows somewhere around about 40 million. Yeah. And I spoke to Stratton about this. Um, and this, but I spoke to another producer, a very good friend of Judith and I, a man called um, Larry DeWay. He was the producer of The Hunt for Red October. Oh, now that's a good okay. film if ever I've seen one, because I know how complex it was to make that film. And that cost a lot of money, but he said, and Pinewood were producing at the time, they were producing the Johnny Depp's um, Pirates, Pirates, Pirates of the, of the Caribbean, Caribbean, which are budgeted somewhere around about 300 million, but gross 1.2 billion. Yeah. Why would Hollywood want to muck around with a tiny little film? La um, Stratton said to me, it's too expensive to give them an office on the lot if you want to make a small film. And I could understand that, you know, it's a business to them. It's just a business. But we don't, need, we don't need Hollywood. We just need money. Right. And, and that's the thing about, you know, people were worried. They were worried for different reasons uh, before the pandemic, you know, legislatively, um, yeah. whether, whether the industry was going to go away, essentially. And, um, I, I've always said when people ask me, I said, follow the money. I yeah. said, as long as there's the ta the Georgia tax incentive and then there's the one for like Savannah area tax incentive on top of that. I said, the people that, you know, work the budgets, they're going to go where it's the cheapest. They're going to set up, you know, I know a friend who worked on four, di three or four different productions over the course of like a couple of years out of the same building, out of the same office. It just, when one film ended, the next yeah. film took that exact yeah. same place and even though they filmed over a lot of the world, they, they, in other parts of the world, they film locally, but you set up the office there and they're going to go where the money is, where it's cheaper. Yeah. You know, it, it yeah. just makes, it's just good fiscal sense. And so as long as the incentives stay there and, and no matter what party comes to power, uh, they need to make sure that the incentives stay there. Cause once yeah. those incentives go, your your North Carolina, your, um, uh, where John came from, um, uh, John Grace, uh, Albuquerque, Albuquerque, yeah, New Mexico, yeah, when, yeah, he told us the famous story of that when they, you know, when they changed the government, changed over, and then the all all the stuff left, you know, it just it gutted the industry, well, and that happened to Wilmington, didn't it? Yes, it did, it did, and day. and and don't think it can't happen here. It could, you know, that's the thing, and that's what scared people. And I had. Um, uh, Charles Bowen on here and he deals in a lot of entertainment law and, yeah, and know. Uh, you, you know, both. Yeah. <laughs> and, well. uh, fascinating gentleman. He, he, yeah, he right. did not sidestep anything. He talked totally to the truth of, of the, the law and, and everything about it. But we, we talked in, in great detail about it and, you know, 
people are just going to go where the money is. You, you're not going to, you know, if you, if you have option A that's, I don't know, 30% cheaper on the budget or option B, you know, you're going to go with A. <laughs> it's just simple math. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Good. But, uh, wow. So yeah. Um, what else? What else? Is there anything we hadn't covered? I know we're going, we're going a little long here, but I, I'm, I'm having a fascinating time. I could probably talk all day, but I know you guys uh, probably can't. So um, is there anything uh, y'all wanted to touch on that we hadn't touched on maybe? No, I think you've done a fantastic job. Getting well, thank you. So, yes. <laughs> well, let's, uh, you know. Yeah, really let's, one story. Ed. This is sure, sure. Long feature film business is like about the one Bond film that I worked on as a cameraman. Um, it's unusual places. Well, we filmed in Switzerland, but the main unit weren't in, oh, the main unit were, they were in Portugal. It was the film that George Lazenby played Bond. And oh, okay. Uh, imagine his, one, his, yeah, okay. And um, we found out that Diana Ring didn't rate George as an actor, so she wouldn't kiss him. <laughs> that was a bit that was a bit different. anyway we were based in Grindelwald in Switzerland and Lauterbrunnen and around there where the Eiger is you know this mountain where certain climbers are still hanging and their mm. parents come to see them every year and well don't it's, this is this is what happened so the Bond wanted a very large ice rink to build at the scene it, you may not remember the scene. I don't know whether you follow the bonds. I, I do, but I haven't seen that okay. one in a very anyway, long time. So, facing <laughs> James Bond, but yeah, he loves James Bond. Up a road to go down a hill, and suddenly you find you're in the middle of a great big motor race that's on ice. The baddies come and follow him, and off they go round this round this great big lake. The Bond Company bought the land, mined it, exploded it, and then flooded it to build this track. Now that takes a bit of money in Switzerland. Wow. The second thing they did, we ran out of generators. We ran out of power to run the amount of lighting we needed to run this at night. We were running things called Brutarks, which you've probably never heard of, never seen one, but they're massive. They basically would light the whole, when you put one up on a tower, it would light the whole of Broughton Street. Wow. From, oh, really from MLK down to maybe Bull. You know, it's, they're big. Like, we, had, we had 12 of them and we ran out of generators. We couldn't run them because it's very cold. And I feel things... like on Galveston, when we were filming it, we were filming it one of the, we used a smaller version of that. We had one, yeah, when we filmed the scene at night. But yeah, well, have... imagine 12 of them. You, <laughs> you know, it was just a lot of power. Anyway, just to tell you what happened. No generators, can't film. What happens? Uh, producer talks to the Swiss government. The Swiss government talk to the uh, power people. The power people say, well, the national grid goes in the ground just at the end of where you're filming. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to dig a hole in this ground and you are going to open up. We are going to give you, I think they gave them 40 seconds we're going to give you 40 seconds and your electrician can plug into the national grid. You've then got a great big cable coming out. And this German did it. And, and that's the sort of experience you have when you're working on a big movie. The power of those pictures, the power of those films in terms of government, because the Swiss really wanted um, Grindelwald to be shown. All the scenes at the hotel and on the ice rink there were in Grindelwald. Very nice part of the world. I mean, lovely part of the world. But it, I mean, now they do bomb tours down there, don't they? Show you where it was filmed and go up to the hotel. You can go and stay in the hotel. And anyway, that's it's just amazing. one of the experiences. I and had. that's and yeah, you could do it inside a sound stage, but it wouldn't be the same, would it? <laughs> <laughs> it might take less power, one but it would be the same. Experience I had in um, in England. We had a big a big movie call it was they built a set it was like a london set with hill, and hills in it like an east london set and we were using it for the battle of stalingrad wow. and the the special effects people had been in they put in all their um explosives and everything 
Uh, my name's Alan, as you know, and so is the special effects supervisor. And somebody shouted out, we ready, Alan? I shouted back, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking, I'm sitting on the camera on a crane and all these explosions start going off. Oh in my gosh. And of course, the guys with the detonators and all heard, is everything okay, Al? Yes. Off they went. <laughs> <laughs> and it took about three days, I think, to redo them. But the cost of a lot of explosions are very expensive to do. And uh, <laughs> that caused a lot of merriment on the film because there was nothing else we could do except go to the bar at Shepherd's. <laughs> well, in the afternoon, I think we went. Anyway, that was a couple of things. I mean, things do happen like that on movies. Yeah. Um, you know, and... Uh, you just got to either laugh at them or you're the producer. You go, home and, <laughs> go home and have a good try. You have it's a like, good try. You know, I wonder, I wonder if the days of, of, of the magic of the movies, you know, people that fall in love with the making of, of a film, I wonder, you know, when we get too far into technology and we can, you know, render it on a computer and, you know, and is yeah. it still, is does it, yeah. you know, is it still the same? Does it still have the same feeling, you know? Well, I, I, yes, I can tell you a movie that I'm absolutely in love with, and it was made without any help whatsoever. It's a film called The Third Man, uh, and it was made in uh, Vienna, just post-war Vienna, and it's about post-war Vienna. And all students of film should watch that movie because it's fantastic. It stars Orson Welles, Trevor Howard, wow. and it is just... It's the, the lighting in it, the night lighting, the, the acting, it is fantastic. I've loved it. And I've always quoted that as one of my favourite films. One of David Lean's films um, with uh, Peter O'Toole. What was that called? The one with the arrows. But that was... Um, Lovely film. I used Lawrence them. of Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence fantastic. of Arabia. That's a fantastic Cinematically film. beautiful yeah. film. Just... Yeah. I used to give a talk about day for night lighting because those scenes were done in the daytime, but made to look like night by a cameraman called Freddie Young, who once owned the Oscars. Nobody, I don't think people can count them. Little English guy who used to go out and do it, work with David Lee. And some of that stuff, you should to just look at it now. It's fantastic. I mean, there was a shot in it where they track from a cave and come out and all the, the marauding hordes. It took them three days to do. Did you know this um, locally? Uh, the theaters we used to go to, I have a friend, and he's very meticulous about his cinema experience from where he sits. I'm like that too. I want to get the, you know, the perfect position, oh, the yeah, perfect right. surround, you know, sound. And, and he literally wrote down everything in the theater that we, we go see movies all the time. And, and I don't want to say, well, you could probably figure out what the movies were. Um, the, 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 um, name of the theater but i don't want to say it here but um this is before the pandemic but he he talked to one of them and they said on the bulbs or and i might not be using the right terminology but the bulbs they turn them down on the projectors they don't put them on certain screens they're not like full i guess brightness or whatever yeah yeah and he they actually admitted that they did that on some of them and because uh, I think it, it stemmed from one time, you know, when you, you know, when you watch something that's a scene that's filmed at night and you can't see it like the, like the famous uh, Game of Thrones episode that was filmed oh, yeah. and yeah. it was so incredibly dark. It looks, it, you know, had they just figured that out, you know, it would have been so spectacular, but they've admitted in the theaters that they do that, you know, and, cause, and, and I think what kind of cued him on to it being the bulbs was, he was in a screening and I think one of them went dimmer or something like that. Yeah. So it, the color, the light balance that, or whatever uh, was off. Well, uh, I mean, I, as part of my life, when I was in partnership with a man called Bob Godfrey and we made a film and won an Oscar for the movie, um, we had our own cinema, but I used arcs in the cinema right. and arcs are two carbons that uh, actually join like that and produce then you've got to change them. So you change them, they last for 10 minutes, you change them on the real changeover um, in, in our cinema. And in most cinemas in London, they have a 10 minute. You saw the little circles go through. Right. On the, they change. Anyway, um, then cold light came in, a thing called a cold light, which is a bit like an HMI, and they are incredibly expensive. 
you know, probably three thousand dollars each, maybe three, maybe five thousand each, Yikes. and run them, <laughs> run them low, they'll last you half as long again. But you're going to get a dull picture. You're meant to have X amount of lumens or foot candles on that screen to suit the print that's come in. They'll tell you. I mean, and, and um, you can't mess around with producers' films and do what you like. Yeah. You know. Tomorrow. You know, it's it, and it's and so upsetting. And we'll probably end on this, uh, like um, the cinemas that weren't ready for Gemini Man that they couldn't project it the way we had to go to Beaufort to see it. Well, he, and, he should have known that, shouldn't he? Before right. he started, should have known there was only no, no. But 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 Ang Lee, he had no problem with that. And I actually had a friend um, who actually oh. got to see Life of Pi. He redid. Oh or at least a portion of it with this new 3D technology. And, yeah. and he said it was fascinating. I saw, I saw Life of Pi at Pinewood Studios produced, uh, pro projected exactly as it was made. And, yeah. you know, and when I saw it again, and so I took some, Judith and I went to see it in the normal cinema, looked exactly the same to me. I mean, I understand what he's trying to do. Right, right. With this yeah, and, 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 and George Lucas, like when he did Star Wars and – you know, you hear conflicting reports, you don't know who to believe, you know, good or bad. But he said when he made every film, he was a, he was advancing sound. He was advancing picture. Well, he, he was, was, he, well, he was pioneering things, yeah. uh, mer merchandising. He almost created merchandising single-handedly, you know. Uh, you know, I'll take the merchandising right. rights. You get a little I bit more. Lucas a very clever man. Very yeah, clever. yeah, very you know, I uh, always, you know. Take. Yeah, and, and, but the thing, the thing is that, he said like with the new films um and believe i don't know if he actually said this but reportedly the internet said it's true so right <laughs> but he said he didn't see anything with the disney films that pushed the medium forward he said when he made the films he was pushing the medium forward like when he did episode one they had yoda in there and it was yeah. still a puppet was still frank oz you know and yeah. then and and then by episode two they were able to digitize it and it got better. By the time you got to episode three, you could see the hair follicles and the sweat, you know, and, and that's where, but then it got so far with pushing yeah. the technology. Now, as you said earlier, Alan, we're getting back to more practical effects, you know, and Certainly. that's what Disney kind of went with, I think, with their, their Star Wars trilogy. They try yeah. to get into more and J.J. Abrams and all that and try to get back into the practical effects. So I, I think, you know, what's old is new, what's new is old, you know, yeah. we go through cycle, everything goes through cycles and, and then we find out, you know, what looks better and, you know, and uh, I don't know. Uh, well, thank you guys. Uh, I, I think we need to bring the show to a close. We're almost at two hours here. This is fascinating. I, like I said, I could probably talk all night, but uh, it's time to go. So um i'm gonna end this video is gonna end abruptly <laughs> so so don't okay. take it you know that's just how it ends um uh, but i want to thank you alan uh, and judith moore for joining me this fascinating um episode of savannah on film you it, it's it's a, a pleasure it's an honor to have you both here and and the wonderful stories and, and the knowledge that you've given is is greatly appreciated and i can't thank you enough for, for being here uh, it's our so, pleasure thank you. It's our pleasure okay well well uh so this uh, if so we'll see so everybody's watching this on youtube right now we'll pretend okay this is we're yeah. watching it yeah. so we, yeah. i want to thank everybody for their questions and comments here on youtube that they've left and and the, hopefully the great conversation we've had uh with um Alan and Judith Moore here, and uh, I'm Ed Susevich, and this has uh, been another wonderful episode, fantastic one, I think, of uh, Savannah on Film. And uh, just to remind everybody, Savannah on Film is a voice for the Savannah film industry. And uh, goodbye. Bye now. Bye. Bye. <laughs>